All right, welcome everyone to this last lecture about product structure. So what are we going to look at today? We are going to look at yet another product structure theorem, um, which is a bit different from what we've been looking at so far. So far, we really took planar graphs as the starting point. We've seen how to build a product structure for planar graphs, um, you know, by really exploiting the, the drawing. And today we are going to look at another class of graphs that has a product structure, but uh, the, the proof methods will be a bit different. So this will be uh, the, the topic for most of the lecture, this other uh, product structure. And then at the end, I will try to you know, step back a bit, and give you some perspective of what uh, one can look at in this uh, area. OK. So let me try to motivate the class of graphs that we are going to look at. It's no longer planograms. It's something else. It's called uh, graphs with polynomial growth. Uh, to motivate it, let's look at the usual product structure that we looked at this week. It's a product of the form h times p, where h has bounded tree width and p is a path. Right? So this is what the product structure we have been looking at so far. Um, and if you think of all the, the applications that we covered in the course, q numbers, non-repetitive colorings, and all the others, usually when you understand how, how to control or your problem that you care about, when you take the strong product with a path, Usually, you can take a strong product with a path again. Like, you can iterate, right? If you remember um, the lemma for the Q number, when you take the strong product with a path, Q number increases by roughly a factor of three, right? It was three times the old Q number plus one. So, you know, you can do that multiple times. Same for this variant of non repetitive coloring, there was a factor of four increase. You can do that multiple times. And this is essentially true for all the applications. Uh, of the product structure theorem is that once you understand how to deal with taking the strong product with a path, you can do that finitely many times. And that's the idea of the lecture today. Let's, let's do it more than once. And let's see what we can capture. Um, so we don't, actually, we don't really have a good idea of what can be captured by bounded tree times path times path times path for some number of times path. There are some open problems there, and uh, I will mention at least one at the end of the lecture. But at least, if instead of looking at h times a number of p's, we could look at just you know the second path. What if you start with a path, if you want, and you take the strong product with the path a few times? Right. This is a special case. I mean, if we want to understand which graphs we can capture with this, it's already you know, a good idea, maybe, to understand what you can capture with just a strong product of paths. And that's what we are going to look at today. And this has been studied by Kroth, Gammer, and Lee in 2005. They have a very nice theorem, a very nice theorem and I will try to uh, tell you a bit about this theorem. All right, so this is really the topic for today. What are the graph classes that we can capture with such a product structure? OK, so the answer is in the title. These are the, the graphs with polynomial growth. So let's see what does that mean. So you have a graph G. And I'm going to use this notation that if I have some vertex V and some radius R, V of VR will be my ball, center of that V of radius R. And what I will ask now in this lecture is that these balls, they grow polynomially in size. More precisely, like if you look at the ball of uh, radius r, it has size at most r to some constant, some gamma. So gamma at least one. Okay. So for instance, if you look at paths, well, a path, a ball of radius r in the path has uh, size at most two r, two r plus one, right? So there you can take gamma to be one. Right? So you have a growth rate of 1. Right? I will call gamma my, my growth rate. Now if you look at the grid, well now you have two dimensions. And uh, well, the, the balls, they can grow quadratically. 
So the growth rate is two, etc. Okay. What about if I look at some binary tree? Does it have polynomial growth rate? No, right? Because the the bull has like uh, about two to the r vertices. That's that's not polynomial in r, right? So we are not going to capture binary trees, for instance. We are going to capture uh, nicely behaved graphs where the bull uh, grow polynomially as a function of their radius. Okay, so that's essentially the answer of what we can capture. So let's be more precise. Let's give a quantitative theorem. Uh, <coughs> sorry. So what they proved is the following. Say that you have a graph class and the growth rate is gamma. Then you can take some dimension d which is not much bigger than gamma. Gamma log gamma. I mean, in the first approximation, just think of d as dependence on gamma. Um, and it turns out that for that choice of d, you can find your graph g as a subgraph of p times p times p times p, where you treat this uh, d times. Right? So you have d dimensions, and this d is not much bigger than gamma. Okay? So that's, uh, that's uh, what they proved. It's a very nice theorem. So it's a product structure for, um, for graph class with growth rate. But now for the purpose of this talk, let me you know, rephrase it a bit differently uh, so that it's more convenient to, uh, to play with this notion. But I don't want to, to repeat p times p times p uh, many times. So a uh, natural way to rephrase it is as follows. Let's look at uh, z to the d, and let's look at the L infinity norm. Okay? So when you have two points, uv in z to the d, how do we measure the distance between u and v? We look coordinate-wise what, what's their distance, and we take the maximum. Right? That's uh, how we are going to measure. So for me, in this talk, this means I take it with respect to the L infinity norm. Okay, and now, given z to the d that I see as a vertex set, I can define a graph on it, and what I will do is that I will put an edge between every two points that are at distance exactly one. Right, so I define some graphs that d sub infinity, this is to uh, indicate that I'm using the infinity norm, um, but that's my graph. Right? Now, if you think about it, if you have your graph G, which is in the strong product of P times P times P, iterated D times, then this means that your subgraph G, well, is isomorphic. I wrote it as a subgraph, but at least it's isomorphic to a subgraph of, of this graph, right? Because what does it mean that your graph G is a subgraph of this product? It means that when you look at an edge of G, let's look at an edge UV, in every dimension of the product there, it should map to a vertex or to an edge. Right? So then in the natural mapping in Z to the D, it means that in every dimension, uh, it maps to either the, the same point or to two points at distance one. So when you, know, you look at uh, the two points in Z to the D, they are at distance, uh, uh, they, they, satisfy, they, they are mapped to an edge. Is that clear? Okay, and conversely, right? So if you have a, a, a subgraph here, I'm lo only looking at finite subgraphs, I should have said it. Uh, I, I, can choice, I can choose a P so that I'm a subgraph of this. Okay, so this is why I'm going to rephrase everything in terms of being a subgraph of Z to the, this graph, Z to the D, with the edges. Okay, so let's rephrase the theorem of Crot, Gamma, and Lee. It says that if you have a graph class with growth rate Gamma, then, you know, for some dimension D, which is a bit bigger than Gamma, you can find your graph, any graph G in your class, you can find it as a subgraph of this uh, graph. Uh, ZD. What do I mean by you can find it as a subgraph? I mean that it's isomorphic to a subgraph of. Right? Is the statement clear, everyone? Yeah? 
it, it's a very nice theorem. And now let's think a bit about it before. Yeah, let's think a bit about it. The first remark is that, well, they have this, this gamma log gamma bound on the dimension. And you could wonder whether that's an arbitrary function or if uh, there is something to optimize. It turns out that this is best possible up to the constant factor. Right, so this is really the best you can hope for. And but the second remark, and that's more important for us, is that, well, if you look at that graph, that uh, D, well, this has polynomial growth, right? The balls, they go like R to the D. But it has growth rate D. OK, so what you're doing is that you start with a class with polynomial growth, and you and all the graphs in your class, you embed it as subgraphs of this very nicely structured uh, uh, grids that, uh, that have polynomial code. Right, so it's an approximate characterization of all the classes with polynomial code. That's, uh, that's very nice. OK, so what are we going to do today? So the, the proof of this is. Uh, definitely not trivial, but quite nice. Uh, let me give you a bit of history, and then we are going to look at the proof uh, in a special case of trees. So a bit of history is that this was, uh, before that paper, this was an open problem, in the sense that it was open whether there was any function of gamma that worked. Uh, can you take some D that depends only on gamma? Uh, the previous bounds, they depended on, on gamma and some other parameters of the graph. Um, a second comment is that actually, before that proof, it was even open for trees. Right, so th there was no function of gamma that was known to work for trees. Again, there were some embeddings where the, the, the dimension was bounded by a function of gamma and some other parameter of the tree. For instance, uh, 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 the, the radius of the tree, for instance. That could uh, you can you can find such embeddings, but just as a function of gamma, that was also uh, an open problem. So for trees, it turns out that you can do a little bit better than for graphs. You can do a, you can have a dimension which is big O gamma, so you don't have the extra log gamma, and that's uh, best possible. And that's what we are going to prove today. But before we jump into the proof, let me comment a little bit on how this relates to this. So, as they explain in their paper, they first prove uh, this result for trees uh, using a technique, a probabilistic technique that we are going to, to look at now. And then they took like, the structure of that proof, and each step of that proof, they lifted it up to graphs. And th that, th this is a non-trivial uh, lifting. There is a lot happening, but in a sense, if you look at the proof for trees, you are already capturing uh, a lot of the ideas in their approach. <clears throat> so what I will try now is to give you uh, a glimpse or an idea, or maybe if I have time, even the full proof uh, for, for trees. We are going to see how they, they, they get it for trees. Does the statement make uh, sense so far? Yes, there is a question. Is it easy to see why O of gamma log gamma is best possible? Um, I don't think so. It's a theorem in the paper. I must admit I don't know the construction on top of my head. Uh, it's, the, it's one of the things they, they, they prove. I, I can look it up uh, during the break. But I, I don't think it's easy. Yes? Can you recall the definition of growth rate? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. OK, let's go back. Uh, what, where was it? Here, yes. <coughs> so let's say that. Your class of graphs has growth rate gamma. If you can bound the size of your R balls, the balls of radius R, if you can bound that size by big O of R to the gamma. Right? So growth rate 2 would mean that all the balls are, are of size big O of R squared, where R is the radius. Okay, so for example, if I consider. Uh, <coughs> Can you also go, go back to the theorem? Sure. Uh, sorry for that jumping, but yes. So here, this uh, D yes has 
somehow should depend on the class G. Yes, it is. It does depend. That's a very good point. Right? So you fix some graph class, and then there is a D which goes like <coughs> sorry, which draws like gamma log gamma, but there is a hidden constant factor, and that hidden constant factor depends on on uh, on your class. Or you could go another way. You know, you could change the definition of uh, growth rate here and just no, do not allow a constant factor here. If you don't allow a constant factor here, then uh, your D will only uh, depend on gamma. Okay, but then you have this problem that uh, for R equal 1, there is a, you have a constant, you assume that the first neighborhood is 1. I mean, there is this small yeah, yeah. difficulty, but okay. I mean, it, it really does not matter. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. But uh, yeah, indeed, I mean, if you. If your balls grows like C R squared, then the C that you have, it, sh it, it will have an influence on it. That's just a, a small detail. OK, are we happy to dive into the proof? Can I ask a question? Yes. If the graph be planar, uh, we can improve D? If the graph is planar? Yeah, the glass goes without Well, it, it doesn't have polynomial growth rate. But already the, the complete binary trees, the, the balls, they grow exponentially. Right, so we are, I mean, we are looking at a very restricted setup, right? We are looking. Hmm? Probably she's asking about planar graphs with polynomial growth rate. Ah, planar graphs with polynomial growth rate. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, that's, that's a class with polynomial growth rate. So it's captured by the first theorem, yes. Okay, so we are looking at trees, uh, some class of trees with some growth rate gamma. Right, so the balls are of size big O of R to the gamma, if you have radius R. Uh, now, I'm going to introduce a few definitions, and then I will tell you what is the strategy. But, me, but before I introduce these definitions, Maybe let me give you like a very rough intuition of what would be the, what uh, the proof will look like. Like a, a rough intuition which is actually not correct, but at least you know gives you gives you some uh, approximation to start with. Uh, a rough idea is that you look at your tree T. Let me draw some nice tree. OK, you have your tree T. You root it at some vertex. And you embed your vertex somewhere in Z to the D for a D which is large enough uh, uh, constant times gamma. OK? And say you embed it in the origin. OK? You embed your root in the origin. And now, given the embedding of the root, you are, doing, you are going to do random walks to embed the other vertices of your tree. What do I mean by that? Well, you, you live in a space with d dimensions. You are, this vertex has already been embedded at the origin, let's say, or any a point of your choice. And now to embed some child of it, you know, just take a random neighbor in your graph and embed the child there. And you do that for that child, you do that for that child, and you continue in this way. Right? So that's. That's not what's happening in the proof, but it's the first approximation of what's happening, and you know, it gives you some idea of where we are going. Right? So like a basic idea is do these uh, random walks embeddings and hope for the best. <laughs> but it turns out that if you do that, it's, uh, it's not that easy to, uh, to analyze directly. So what they will do is they, they will do it um, pieces by piece for some right definition of piece. Okay, but at least you know you have some idea of where we are heading. All right, so take some tree T in your class of trees with polynomial growth, and now we are going to try to embed all tree T in Z to the D. I'm going to define what a contraction mapping is, and this is uh, an object that we are going to play with a lot. 
And it's a very easy notion. So let's, uh, let's make sure that it's clear for everyone. The idea is that you're going to embed the vertices of your tree into your space in Z to the D. But this won't be an, in, an injective mapping. So um, it's completely fine you know, to put vertices, distinct vertices on the same point so far. Okay? So in a contraction mapping, it's completely allowed to have multiple vertices embedded in the same point. Okay? But the condition that we want to satisfy is that whenever you have an edge UV, then U and V, they should be mapped to points which are distance at most one. So what does that mean? It means that either U and V are mapped to the same point, in which case they are distance zero, and then the condition is trivially satisfied, or if they are mapped to distinct point, well, they should be a distance exactly one, in which case it's really an edge of our graph, ZD. Right? So another way to, to rephrase this is that in this contraction mapping, if you have an edge UV and you map it to distinct points, then this should map to an edge of, uh, of the, the graph ZD. Does that make sense? OK. Uh, yes, there is a question. So, but uh, if there are points that follow the condition that the distance is not equal to one, it's not necessary for them to have an edge, right? Uh, yes, of course. Yes, so you can you can have two non-adjacent vertices of your tree which are put at distance one. That's completely fine, right? Because we are we are realizing our tree as a subgraph of uh, Z to the D. We are not realizing it as an induced subgraph. If we were caring about induced, uh, induced subgraphs, then indeed we would have to check that. Thanks for this remark. All right. OK, so that's the contraction mapping. And what, what, what is the, like, the basic strategy of this proof? Well, we are going to build a contraction mapping. We are going you know, to modify it uh, iteratively. And eventually, after massaging that contraction mapping a lot, in the end, we will get that it's an injective mapping. Well, if it's injective, then what's happening? What's happening is that every two distinct vertices UV, they're mapped to distinct points. Okay? So if you have an edge UV, there, then U and V are mapped to distinct points, and so they will be at distance exactly one. Right? So every vertex is mapped to a distinct point, and the edges are mapped to edges of Z to the D. So this shows that you show that your tree T is actually occurring as a subgraph of Z to the D. Or more precisely, it's isomorphic to a subgraph of Z to the D. Happy with that? OK, so that's the game. We are going to build contraction mappings, and we are going to modify them. Uh, we, are, we will always keep the property that we play with contraction mappings. And then eventually, at the end, if everything goes well, we will did use that we got um, contraction mapping, which is injective, and then we are done. OK. That's uh, one, one uh, definition. OK, let me, a little bit, let me be a little bit more precise about how, what, how we are going to define these contraction mappings. Um, I will give you a first approximation. The first approximation is that we are actually going to define four contraction mappings. Phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, up to phi 4. And each one will live in a space where the number of dimensions is, is big O of gamma. So it's about the right number of dimensions. So each one will be a contraction mapping. Now we are going to concatenate these contraction mappings, meaning you, know, you just uh, put them one next to the other using separate dimensions. So you incur only a factor of 4 in terms of the number of dimensions. This is T big of gamma. And obviously, if you concatenate contraction mappings, you still have a contraction mapping. Why? Well, take your edge UV. And you can look at that in each dimension, it will be mapped to uh, two integers which are distance at most one, right? So that distance in, in the whole space will be uh, at most one. So it's still a contraction mapping. So concatenating con contraction mappings gives you a contraction mapping. That's kind of clear. But we will do it in such a way that you know, when you take the concatenation, you get an injective mapping. Right? So the, the idea is that each one of these four contraction mappings will do part of the job of creating an injective mapping. 
right? So we are we are distributing the work on, on four different contraction mappings. Okay, so far it's a bit uh, it's a bit of an abstract setup, but at least you see where we are going. Now let me you know give you uh, a couple of more technical definitions, and then we are going to see how we build these contraction mappings. And there you are going to see that this is actually related to, in a sense, to these random walks that I, I alluded to. All right, so the logs say we've been BS2. Okay. And I will look at the diameter of my tree, so the uh, longest uh, length of a longest path in my tree. And I will take log log of that, that will be k. This will be some parameter that we look at. Our trees don't have bounded diameter, right? So you have to think that k is some large integer, probably. Uh, take the ceiling so that it's an integer. Now define a function f of i to be 2 to the 2 to the i. The particular shape of this function is not important. What is important, and the only thing we need for the proof to work, is that if, when you look at f of i, when, when i is at least 1, this is actually the square of f of i minus 1. Right? So f of 0 is, is 2. Right? And then the each next value, you take the square of the previous value. Okay, so this is the only property that we are going to use, right? F of i is the square of f of i minus one. And given how we define k, well, k is roughly log log of the diameter, so f of k is two to the two to log log of the diameter, so it's at least the diameter, but it's at most the diameter square because when you take the, the ceiling, you add at most plus one. Okay, so far? So, you know, you just have to remember that f of i is this fast-growing function where you take the square at each step. And now we are going to, uh, to do a partitioning of our tree t into small subtrees. And this will be the, the main object for this proof. And there will be such a partitioning for every value of i between 0 and k. Right? So we are going to look at i, zero, i equal to 0, 1, etc., up to k. And for every value of i, we are going to partition the, our tree t into vertex disjoint trees. And they, they will have small height, of some definition of small. So how do we do that? Uh, OK, let me say it, and then I'm, I'm going to illustrate it on the board. Fix an i. And now look at all the edges that are distance 0 mod 3 fi. Factor 3 is just, just there for a technical, uh, condition, uh, technical reason, but it's roughly mod fi, but you do mod 3 fi. OK, so you look at all the edges at distance 0 mod 3 fi, and you remove these edges. Right, so e sub i will be the, the edges that I remove. So I, set, I mark these edges, I remove them. Right, so I have my tree. And you know, every three of I level, I remove the edges. What's the distance of edge? It, uh, it doesn't matter for this proof. Um, maybe you define it as the minimum distance of an endpoint to the root. Um, it actually really does not matter. You can <laughs> a any definition that makes sense, as long as on a BFS three, all the edges on between two consecutive layers are at the same distance, this is the only thing I'm using. And that it's increasing by one at each step. Okay? So okay, but let's say let's say you use the minimum distance of an endpoint. That's uh, that's fine. Thank you for this question. Okay, so you, you have this picture in mind, right? You have your rooted tree and then you know every tree at five level you remove all the edges between that level and the previous one. So what, what you end up with is, you know, a bunch of connected components, a bunch of small trees. The height of these trees, it would be at most 3FI. Why at most? Well, it could be a bit less towards the end of the process, right? But like in the typical setup, it would be, uh, uh, in the middle, it would be 3FI, and then at the boundary, it, can, it could be less. Now, these small trees, um, they are naturally rooted. Just root, and root them at the vertex closest to the root of T. All right, so that's the, the setup. Let's, uh, let's try to picture it, because we are going to play a lot with that. 
right? So for some value of i, I'm maybe I have some first tree. And then I delete some edges. Then I again have some trees. Then again, I delete some edges. And I keep going. Right? And this, these trees in blue will be, will be in my set AI. Right? So AI will be the set of all the trees I obtain in this way. So in other words, the connected components I get by deleting my, my edges in red, which are distance 0, not 3 or 5. Does it make sense, the, the definition of AI? Right? So this is really the main character of this proof, this partitioning that we have for every I. And you know, we are going to play with this partitioning uh, this, with this partition for each value of i uh, to eventually uh, define uh, our contraction mapping, which is injecting. So let's make a few observations. One that we already did is that if you look at any tree, usually I would use x for uh, to denote one of these small trees in blue. So if I look at some tree x, which is in AI, it has small height for some definition of small. It has height at most 3 or 5. Right, because I do this mod tree of uh, selection for my, for my edges. Okay, so they, they have small height. The next thing to observe is that, well, you know, when you go from round i to round i plus 1 and you redo this, this uh, selection, the edges that you are going to select, it's a subset of the edges that you selected before. Right, so think of what's happening when i is 0. When i is 0, well, uh, fi is 2, so 3fi is 6, so you are selecting uh, the edges that are 0 mod 6, right? So you have these tiny trees, right? But now you increase i, and now 3fi is increasing, so the, tr the trees are increasing. But the thing is that if you are 0 mod 3fi, you are also 0 mod 3fi minus 1, right? Because fi is fi minus 1 squared. <laughs> right, so the, the edges that you are going to select at the next step, it's a, step, it's, a, it's a subset of the edges that you selected in the current step. And this means that, you know, when you look at some tree that you, in your collection AI, that you got at the current step, this tree it will be contained in a bigger blue tree in the next step. Right? You can think of the, the trees in the next step as, you know, taking together some of the trees of the previous step plus the connection in between. And that's the picture to have in mind, right? So, it's the, this AI is there in, the, in a sense. This, this, this is a partition of your tree into small trees, but these partitions they they are refinements, uh, like, uh, uh, starting from AK, which is like uh, the the coarsest one, and A0, which is the finest. Make sense so far? I mean, we haven't done much, right? We have just defined this partition for, uh, for, for every i. Um, but now we are, OK, yeah, first, well, actually, I need to do, redo exactly the same, but with some offset. So and this is just for a technical reason. It's not important. But this slide is doing exactly the same thing as before, as for every i. The only difference is in red now that now we are going to look at the edges which are uh, a distance fi mod 3fi. But otherwise, you define everything else the same. Right? So you just put an offset uh, at the beginning. And why do we do that? Well, we see that in a moment. We'll see that in a moment. But this defines bi. And we do that so that we have the following property. Take any uh, pair of vertices uv in your tree. I will use p uv for the uv path for the unique path between u and v in the tree. Now, if you think of a pair uv where that path is of length at most fi, so meaning, in other words, I mean, the distance between u and v is the length of that path, right? So if you, you look at a pair uv where the path is a distance at most f of i, 
Well, I claim that you know there is some tree either in AI or in BI that accommodates this path in the sense that there is some blue tree either in AI or in BI that contains completely your path. Okay, let's check quickly why this is true. And right, so you have. some UV in your tree, the distance, uh, the, the distance between U and V is at most f of i. And now, well, you know, this is living somewhere in your tree, this, this path. And now think of what happened when we defined AI. Let's go back to the fin definition of AI. Well, we selected you know, we removed all the edges in between two consecutive rows where <coughs> these edges were distance 0 mod 3 fi. Right? So, you know, every 3 fi layers, we remove all the, the edges uh, between two consecutive layers. And there are two things that can happen. Either when we do that, this path survives. Right? So maybe we, uh, we remove some edges above and then we remove some edges in a layer below, but somehow this path was not hit. If that's the case, then this path will be the connected component of the graph you get when you delete these edges. Right? So it will be in one of the trees of AI in that case. Second possibility is that when uh, uh, bad luck, actually when you define AI, you, you cut through your path at some point. You remove all the edges in between two consecutive layers and bad luck is actually uh, took some edges of your path. But you know, this path is of length at most f of i. That's the assumption uh, on the next slide here. Right? So then, you know, just by offsetting by f of i, you know that you won't cut that path. And that's exactly what bi is doing. Right? So the, the bi is just there to, you know, accommodate these pairs that uh, were somehow cut by, by ai. And also the free is here. Yes, and the tree fi is there for that reason as well. Is that? I mean, intuitively, I would I want to say yes, right? Um, yeah, I think so. Let me. No, it, it uh, really doesn't. <laughs> so maybe they put a three just to, be, to simplify some calculations. But yeah, intuitively a two should be enough. <coughs> Anyways, the point here is that um, when you define AI, you might cut some of these paths of length at most fi. But then th those paths that you cut, they won't be cut when you define BI. And that's the only reason for defining BI. Okay? Otherwise, AI and BI, they will play ex ex exactly the same role. We are going to do the same with respect to AI and BI. Uh, and there is really no difference between these two partitions. So, again, what is AI? Okay, what is AI? Let's go back to the definition. All right, so I look at the edges at distance 0, mod 3, FI from the root. Okay? And I, I delete these edges. I get, I get a bunch of connected components. and each connected component is a small tree, and AI is the collection of these small trees. Right, so I can think of AI as a collection of trees. I can think of AI as a partition of the vertex set of my tree. These are all valid uh, views. OK? Let's, uh, OK. And let's you would have two instead of three, you would have to like, have plus one, right? Probably, yes. To make three is nicer than plus one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let, let's not, you know, thank you, but let's not get distracted by this tree or two. The point is that by switching by with this offset, BI will accommodate the pairs UV that were cut by, by AI, and that's, that's the important thing. All right, so there are two more definitions, and then I promise you that there won't be more definitions after that. Right, so what did we have so far? We had the notion of a contraction mapping. We are happy with that. We have this partitioning AI and the corresponding partitioning BI. 
for every r. That's what we defined so far. And we need two more notions. Uh, and, and then we can really do the proof. The first notion is the notion of separating some AI. So say you have some mapping, and in the proof this will be a contraction mapping. So you have some mapping phi that you know, maps the vertices of t to points in the 2 d Definitely not injective, but in the proof this, this will be a contraction mapping. And say that it separates AI if it satisfies the following condition. Whenever you look at some tree x in your collection of small trees, some tree in blue here, and whenever you look at two vertices uv in that tree, right, so I take some tree in blue, I take two vertices u and v, and you know, I'm going to assume that these two vertices they are not too close to each other. When I look at their distance, it should be at least f of i minus 1. Right, so I'm looking at pairs of vertices uv in some small tree in my collection AI, but I'm not looking at any pairs of vertices in my tree. I'm looking at those that are not too close to each other. And not too close to each other means distance at least f of i minus 1. And I would also assume that the distance is at most f of i. That's just saying well, they're not too, too far from each other because, you know, possibly the height is 3 fi, so possibly the diameter is 6 fi. So, you know, you could be a bit further away than fi. But that's not, that's not too important. What's important is that they are not too close to each other. Okay? So these are the pairs that I'm going to look at. And somehow these are the pairs that I care about when I look at my partition AI. These are the pairs UV that I really care about. And the intuition is that I, when I look at such an I, I will want to construct a contraction mapping which is injective for those pairs. So I want that these pairs of vertices, they are mapped to distinct points. And that's the notion of a separating map. But so I want that if I ever have such a pair UV, not too close to each other, and together in some blue tree, in some tree x in the eye, then I want that u and v are mapped to distinct points. So that's the notion of uh, separation. And this is a way, you know, to, to, to distribute the job of building an injective mapping over uh, a smaller task. So we, are, we have, of course, the same definition with, with respect to bi. And now the key observation is that, well, if you have some map that separates AI and BI for all I, then it's an injective uh, mapping. And why is that? Well, give me two distinct vertices U and V of your tree. And I need to check that they are mapped to distinct points. Okay? Now I look at the distance between the distance between U and V. I look at the path between U and V. That distance for some i will be sandwiched between f i minus 1 and f i. There will be some i where the distance is between f i minus 1 and f i. Look at that i. Okay? But also, by the previous observation, because the distance is at most f i, this path leaves in some blue tree, either in a i or in b i. There, there, there is a tree that accommodates, uh, a tree from the i round that accommodates this path. So there is some blue tree that contains the corresponding path. That path is of length at most f of i. It's at of length at least f of i minus 1. And we assume that our mapping is separating a i and b i. So we have that u and v are mapped to distinct points. Okay? So far, this is just a bunch of definitions, right? But you, you see that we are building an approach here. We have the starting task, which is build a contraction mapping which is injective. And now we reduce to smaller task. And the smaller task is, you know, build a contraction mapping which is separating a0, a1, a2, a3, a4, b0, b1, b2, b3, b4, etc. And then what we are going in, in, to do in the proof is that we are going to look at a, the AIs and the BIs separately. Say we focus on the AIs. And then we are going to try to separate first a0 and then A1, and then A2, and then A3, iteratively. 
So you know, we reduce into smaller tasks. Yes. Yes. So what you're asking, I guess, is say that you have a pair UV where the distance is between a phi minus one and a phi, but when you look at AI, there is no tree accommodating that pair in the sense that the, the path between U and V is not contained into one of these uh, trees in AI. That's what we are asking. Yeah. Okay. And then that's exactly where uh, BI jumps in because BI is there to handle these pairs. So by the, the property we discussed before, if, the, if that path is cut in AI, it won't be cut in BI. So in other words, in BI, there will be some tree in the collection BI that contains completely the path between U and V. Yeah. Okay? And then we, we assume that our map here is separating all the AIs and all the BIs, and so we are fine. Okay? Thank you for this question. Are there other questions before I keep going? Okay, let me continue. So we have the notion of separation, and now I can tell you a little bit more about the strategy. And you will see why we get four contraction mappings and not just one in this strategy. So the first thing, uh, is that we are going to look at the AIs and the BIs separately. Right? So we are going to try to s build a contraction mapping that separates the AIs, and then we are going to build another contraction mapping that separates the BIs. But then when we look at the AIs, we are actually going to separate them into two sets again, according to the parities, for just for the, for, to make the proof work. <laughs> okay? There is, I mean, at this stage, there is no reason for this separation except that, you know, it helps <laughs> the proof. <laughs> okay, so we are actually going to first construct a, con um, a contraction mapping that separates A0, A2, A4, A6. So all the AIs with I even. <coughs> and then we are going to do the same job with A1, A3, A5, A7. And then the same with B0, B2, B4. The same with B1, B3, B5, etc. And these will be four contraction mappings. Each one will have a number of dimensions which will be big O of gamma. Okay, these are contraction mappings. We take the concatenation, this is still a contraction mapping, and all together, well, they will separate everything. And so by the observation we made, this will be an injective mapping. Okay? So that's the strategy. Notice that I still haven't told you how do we build these embeddings, right? But we are, going, we are going to get there. But at least now we have a strategy, right? We have a mapping, uh, we have a partition into small trees, and you know, we, we separated the task of building a, a contraction mapping which is injective into the smaller task of separating the AIs and the AIs, and we are going to focus on the AIs and the AIs separately, and then we are only looking at the even ones or the odd ones with respect to their indices. OK, so now it turns out that we are going to focus on the first case, separating A0, A2, A4, A6. Because once you see how to do that, the other proofs are exactly the same. It's exactly the same thing, except that instead of starting with A0, you start with A1, or you start with B0, or you start with B1. But otherwise, it's exactly the same strategy. There is nothing that changes uh, except the starting point, in a sense. So once you see the proof for this, it adapts in a straightforward way for the others. So I'm going to, separate, I'm going to focus on this task, uh, separating A0, A2, A4, A6. Okay? So I want to build a contraction mapping that separates these guys. This is my new task, my new job. Okay, this is my goal. And now we are, to the, we are uh, going to introduce the last definition but this is an important one because it will tell you, uh, it will give you an idea of how we actually build these embeddings, how we build these contraction mappings. Okay, so we want to build a contraction mapping that separates A0, A2, etc. Now, you know, let's start with some smaller task. And let's just look at some tree 
x in the i for some i. Okay. So I have some tree x, and I'm going to think about what I could do locally to embed the nodes of my tree x. So I'm going just to imagine that somehow, for some reason, I just care about x. And then I'm going to proceed with the different subtrees x in AI separately, then I'm going to, to uh, glue everything together. But so far, just, I'm just going to look at one x, one tree x in AI for itself, and I'm going to try to embed that. Okay? And I, I emphasize the word try because what I'm going to describe does not always work. There will be some probabilistic argument and it will work with some uh, uh, non-zero probability. Okay, so now I'm looking at some x. Let's zoom on some tree x. Okay, it's naturally rooted, right? And this x belongs to some now, what is the game that we are playing? And the, the point of these definitions is to formalize this game. The game is the following. Imagine that the root is already embedded somewhere. If you need to have like a concrete picture of where the root is, pretend that it's embedded at the origin, for instance. But it could be embedded anywhere in, uh, in Z2D. But, so imagine that the root is already embedded, so the origin, and now, what you are going to do is, for every edge in this uh, 3x, we are going to define some, some weight vector that we put on that edge. The weight vector has some dimension d, right? so that's the dimension of our ambient space. And every component of that weight vector will be minus 1, 0, or 1. As we are going to see later, most of these weight vectors, they will be chosen randomly, independently, and there will be some deterministic choice. Okay, so that's, we are going to see how we make these choices later, but for now, just assume that, you know, someone gives you these, these uh, choices of weight vectors, and then we are going to see how to, uh, to embed the other nodes of my tree according to these weights. Well, we are going to do it in the obvious way, right? So if, we, if the root is already embedded, for instance, at the origin, then how do I embed a child? Well, I take the embedding of my root, and I just add the corresponding weight vector to that embedding. Yes? And why is this valid? Well, your, your root was embedded somewhere, now you go to, the, to uh, some child, and then in every component among the d d d dimensions that you have, in every component, you either remove one, or do nothing if it's zero, or add one. So it means that in every component, the change is at most one. And because we are playing with the L infinity norm, it means that the new point is at distance at most one from the previous point. Right? So so when you do that, and you have some weight vector on the edge, well, two things can happen. Either nothing changes, like the weight vector is zero everywhere, in which case, well, the two points are embedded still on, the, the two vertices are embedded on, on the same point. This is fine. We are defining contraction mappings. We are not make, defining an injective mapping. OK, so it could be, you know, that some child is still embedded on the same point. That's completely fine. Uh, otherwise, if, you know, some of the weights are non-zero, then you are actually going to move in one of the dimensions, and then the two points will be at distance exactly one. But this will define the contraction mapping, right? Whenever you have an, uh, an edge of your tree x, when the two, uh, the two endpoints, they will be mapped to points either to the same point or to points which are distance one. Okay? So given a starting point here for, for my root, I can and, and weight vectors on my edges, I can just you know propagate and have a, and have an, uh, uh, a corresponding embedding of all the nodes in my tree. And locally for x, this will be a contraction. And this is the I mean this is very uh, there is nothing going on here. 
But this is like the main strategy to build embeddings. I want to make sure that this is really clear. Is this clear how we build? Right, so we have weight vectors on the edges, we proceed from top to bottom, and we, we just sum the weight vectors along the path. And now if you imagine these weight vectors to be chosen at random, we are actually doing these random walks that I mentioned before. Except we are not going to do exactly that, but we are going to do mostly that. That's the idea of the pool. The weight vector is fixed for a given tree at the moment? So, so far, I didn't tell you how the weight vectors are chosen. I'm just imagining that someone gives me the weight vectors, and I tell you how to build an embedding from it. Because there are different paths in the tree, you should, I guess, make the difference. Yeah, yeah. So it will be a combination of random choices and some deterministic choices. But given any set of weight vectors, I can define an embedding <coughs> in this way. Not necessarily a good one. For instance, I could have I could have a bunch of zero vectors. In which case, you know, I'm I'm, uh, I'm not distinguishing these vertices. But yeah, that's that's one way to do it. Okay. So now these two definitions, they are just there to formalize this. So this mu of x, mu sub x, it's it's just saying that for every edge of x, you have a corresponding weight vector. And then this mu star sub x is just the corresponding absolute embedding, the corresponding embedding that you get. And well, if you look at the definition, this is assuming that the root has been embedded at the origin. Later on, the root will be embedded somewhere, and you know, uh, the embedding will just be translated by uh, whatever uh, point the, the root is embedded at. But that's how we did it. So we, we do the sum of the weight vectors along the path from the root to the vertex that you look at. Okay, that's the key definition. So I, I want to make sure it's 100% clear. Yes? Okay. Now, as we discussed, when you do this, you define a contraction mapping with respect to this uh, 3x. And now, imagine that, imagine that you, you, know, you did that for every 3x in your collection AI, and you did that separately. Like, you look at each x uh, in your collection AI, you looked at it on, for, on its own, and you, know, you found a nice, uh, nice weight vector so that the, the corresponding absolute embedding is nice for x, for, for a good definition of nice. And that you did that like, separately, independently. Uh, then how do you combine all of that into one uh, embedding of T? Well, you do it in the kind of obvious way that you define weight vectors for all the edges of your tree T now. And now when you have two types of edges, you have edges which are inside one of the blue trees, and then you just use whatever weights you define when you looked at that blue tree. Or you have edges in red here which are in between two blue trees that you cut. And then just put a weight of zero on these edges. Right, so if you have a related embedding, so weight vectors for the edges of all your blue subtrees, you can lift that to, uh, to weight vectors of all the edges of your tree by just you know, adding uh, zero weights on the edges that you didn't look at, the edges between. Okay, so this, this gives you weight vectors for all the edges of my tree. Now I can assume that the root is embedded at the origin. And I can do the same game, right? But with respect to the whole tree now. And <coughs> when I do that, I have a mu star, which is the corresponding absolute embedding. So whatever I get starting from the root and you know, summing up these weight vectors along paths. And the, the key observation is that if you look at any blue tree now here in your collection, in this absolute embedding of T, What's happening? Well, you know, you start from the root, and then at some point, you arrive at the root of that blue tree, right? That root, before we pretend that it was embedded at the origin, now it's embedded somewhere else in the tree, at <coughs> some point. So it's translated somewhere. But what you are going to do next, it's exactly what you were doing before, right? So the embedding of all these vertices that you have here I mean, in a sense, these embeddings stay the same. They're, they are just translated by the same amount. Right? So the, the pairwise distances, they stay the same. Right? So that's what this is saying. 
that when you play this game, you look at any three x in that collection and any pairs, of, any pair of vertices in that tree, well, the distance don't change when you do that. The only thing is that everything is translated. Okay, so this is how we are going to uh, to proceed. Uh, it, in a sense, what we want to do is we want to build a contraction mapping that separates AI. That's, that's part of our job, right? <laughs> and now we, do, we separate that in an even uh, smaller set of tasks. Uh, well, in, in smaller tasks, is <coughs> instead of separating all the AIs, well, you know, we are going to look at each uh, tree X in AI separately, and we are just going to look at that tree and build a nice, nice weight vectors for that tree. And once we found them, we just combine everything together in this way. And, uh, and then we are going to separate the AIs in this way. So that's the strategy, right? So we, this will allow us to, to, um, to focus on um, just separate trees. So let me be a bit more precise now. Um, and I might leave a lemma for the exercise session given the time. But I will at least try to give you uh, the full strategy of how we do the embedding. And then there will be a probabilistic lemma that probably uh, we skip the proof here. OK, so what's the, what's the, the goal? We have A0, A2, A4, A6, etc., And we want to separate all of them. So first, I'm going to separate a first few of them. So I'm going to separate A0, A2 up to some AQ, where Q is just some large enough constant. I'm not telling you how to choose Q. It's just large enough so that the probabilistic argument that comes next will work. Okay? So it's just a big, big constant. And when the dimension that we are playing with, it's, two, it's always big of gamma. So let's say it's C times gamma. Uh, and again, assume that C is large, again, for the probabilistic argument to work. So what do we do first? First, we want to separate A0, A2 up to AQ. And this, this, is, this will be easy to do because Q is a constant. And then it means that the trees that we have in that collection, they have constant height. Right? I mean, look at AQ, which has the biggest trees. The height is at most 3 times f of Q. It's still a constant. So they have constant height, and they have polynomial growth. We, we can do something brute force here. So let's do it. And this is how we initialize uh, the proof, which is uh, really a proof by induction on R. So this is really the base case of the proof. OK, how do we do it? Well, let's assume this is this is actually some x, which is an AQ. Let's say that I'm looking at some blue tree in AQ. So I will focus on AQ, and I will uh, define a contraction mapping which, which is such that when I look at any tree in AQ and I look at any two vertices in a tree in AQ, they will be mapped to distinct points. Okay? And if I, if I do that, then I'm going to separate AQ, but actually I'm going to separate all the previous AIs as well. Because I'm, I'm not imposing any condition on this distance here. I'm really doing every pair UV, which is uh, uh, in, uh, in a tree in AQ, and I will map them to distinct points using brute force. And this will also, so this will separate AQ, but it will separate the previous one as well. Because, you know, if you have a pair UV whose distance is between Fi minus 1 and Fi, and I is less than Q, and it's living in some, in some tree uh, that belongs to some a i prime, uh, where i prime is at least at most q. But then that tree will be contained in one of these big trees of a q. And when I look at that big tree, and I know that there, 
I put the, my two vertices to these two points. Right? So with this brute force, I'm going to separate all of them at once uh, by just focusing on the trees in AQ. All right, how do we do that? Well, this is the most stupid embedding, but we can afford it because we, we, we are just looking at uh, Q to be a, a constant. So what do we do? Well, let's enumerate the vertices of this, um, of this uh, tree as, I don't know, V1, V2, up to Vn. Now I can look, I can encode the IDs of these vertices uh, using plug and mix. Okay, let's put a ceiling so that we are safe. So using log n bits, where m is the number of vertices in my tree, I can encode these vertices uh, in binary. So I have binary strings. Right? And these, 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 these bit strings, that will be the embedding of my points. OK, so why can we, why can we afford to do that? And this is where we use polynomial growth. Well, what can we say about m? m is the number of vertices in that tree. And this is at most the number of vertices in a ball of radius at most 3fq. Right? So this is at most some constant c prime times um, 3fq to the gamma. Right? Because I mean this, this blue tree there, it has height 3fq at most. So it leaves in a ball of radius at most 3 of q, and then by my condition on the growth rate, it means that that ball has at most this many vertices for some c prime. Right? Okay? So when I take log n, I get, you know, I get gamma log of 3 of q plus a big growth. This is a constant. So log m is a constant times gamma. Okay? So if we choose our dimension to be margin of constant times gamma, we have enough space, enough dimensions to just encode these bit strings. Okay? So that's what I mean by brute force. Is here in that setup, we can just, you know, use a binary encoding. <laughs> And that gives, a, that gives an embedding of binary. And by the way, why is this working? Well, first, it's definitely, it's definitely the case that it's a contraction mapping. Because if I look at any edge of my tree here, and I look at the corresponding bit strings, well, in each component of my bit string, I have a 0 or a 1. So they definitely are distance at most 1. So in terms of defining a contraction mapping, this is fine. Why is it locally injective, meaning injective on x? Well, they each get a different idea, right? So I, I distinguished all the, all the nodes of my tree x in this way. You're happy with that? OK, so what did we do there? We used brute force on x. We defined this absolute embedding, like a real embedding of the vertices of x in z to the d, and that embedding is a contraction mapping, it, it, it's an injective when you re restrict to the vertices in X. Okay, but what we want actually is weight vectors. We want weight vectors because we need them when we switch to the probabilistic argument. However, you know, imagine without loss of generality, imagine that the root is embedded at the origin, I mean, at the, the old zero bit string, okay? So imagine that you put the all zero bit string for the for the root. Now you can define corresponding weight vectors so that when when you do the, the business with respect to the weights, you actually get your IDs back. Why? Well, here it's uh, all zero. Then the child here has some bit string which is its ID. Okay. 
Now, just put the weights on the edge so that when you go from this vertex to this vertex, you actually get the ID there. Right? So if you go from a 0 to a 1 in some component, then you put a, a weight of 1 in that uh, dimension. And later on, if you are going to some vertex here to a vertex there where in some dimension you go from a 1 to a 0, you put a minus 1 in that uh, weight, in the, that dimension for the weight. And you know, if in some dimension uh, you are not changing, then you just put a 0. Right? So by choosing in the right way your weight, if you assume that you start at the origin, you can find weight vectors that generate your, your stupid embedding, your, your brute force embedding. OK, so that's exactly what uh, we, we do here. We assume that for every tree x, well, we do this brute force embedding, but then we compute these weight vectors that produce this brute force embedding. And we forget about the brute force embedding. We now have these weight vectors that produce it. OK, so what did we do? Well, we, we produced weight vectors so that when you look at the absolute embedding corresponding to these weight vectors, you are actually separating all the AIs, where it, i is at most q. So you might say, OK, but wait, you only looked at one x. Why is it working for all the x's in aq? Because, I mean, this is exactly what we discussed in the previous slide. When you look at your subtrees x separately and you define weight vectors separately for them, then you can just, you know, uh, take the union of, uh, you, know, you can just combine these weight vectors by putting weights of zeros on, uh, on the edges that do not appear in the eye. And then the, the absolute embeddings, they will be the same, except, you know, that you might translate some vertices. Okay, so what's happening is, you know, in each, in uh, AI where I is Q in this case, or in AQ, we locally look at each tree, each blue tree, we do this brute force embedding, we compute the corresponding weight vectors, we have the corresponding weight vectors. Now we, we look at the whole tree T, on the red edges that you removed, you put a weight of zero, and now you have weight vectors for the whole tree, and this produces an absolute embedding for your tree, so that when you look at each Subtree that is in AI, it, it's uh, it's locally injective on those uh, on those uh, on those trees. So those guys, they, their vertices get mapped to distinct points. In particular, this means that this uh, these weight vectors that we defined so far they separate a0, a2, a4, a6, up to aq. Okay, and that's the basis of the induction. Yes, there is a question. Apparently, it's just this with the definition of f, which is like 2 to the 2 to the i. Uh, is it uh, something else? Why do we need the parity? Why do we need i to be even? Um, yeah, OK. I, I try to give an intuition in, <coughs> in the next slide. So it, the, the short answer is that we need, we need to skip uh, one step each time, uh, because we need some freedom in the probabilistic argument. So that's a short answer. I, I try to be a bit more concrete uh, now. OK, so we did the, the, uh, the basis of the induction. And now comes really the heart of the proof. And this is, in my opinion, this is really a beautiful idea. It's, it's, it's super nice. OK, so we, we started the machine. We have these weight vectors that we, we came from these brute force arguments. What we know is that these weight vectors, they separate a0, a2, up to aq. And we have a contraction mapping that does that, which is the, the absolute embedding resulting from these weight vectors. And now we know, you know, what we want to do is we want to go further. So for every i starting at q and then going to q plus 2, q plus 4, etc., we want to work on the assumption that we have some weight vectors whose absolute embedding separates a0, a2, up to ai. So we do have that at the beginning, right? Because we have that for i equal to q. We have some weight vectors so that the absolute embedding separates a0, a2, up to aq. So that's how, this is how we start. And then under this assumption, we want to show that there is a way to modify some of the weight vectors so that we get a new set of weight vectors. Let's go with mu i plus 2. So that when you look at the corresponding set of uh, when you look at the corresponding absolute embedding, 
you also separate i plus 2. And you won't lose the fact that you separate the previous AI. Why? Because we are going to make sure that it is, that it is built so, so that you separate AI plus 2. And we are going to make sure that if you look at any 3x in blue that was considered before, so the, which is part of A0, A2, A4, up to AQ, uh, AI, sorry, so a tree that was considered before, and if you look at any two vertices UV in that tree, we are going to make sure that the distance between these, the, these two points does not change. Right? These two points, they, can, they might get translated somewhere, but their respective distance won't change. And the, the fact that the distance don't change means that you know uh, you still separate uh, the previous sets. You still separate A0, A2, up to AI. And so that's the strategy. We are going to work in rounds. And each round, we want to separate one more set without screwing up anything else that we, we did before. Yes? So we are only allowed to modify the weights on the uh, <coughs> like edges which are at distance 0 modulo fi? Modulo 3 fi, yes. Modulo 3 fi. Yes, that's a very good, uh, good intuition. And that's exactly what's happening in this proof. So what's happening is that you give me these weight vectors that work all the way up to AI, meaning that the corresponding absolute embeddings separate these guys. And now what I'm going to look at, you know, I'm going to look at AI, and I'm going to look at the edges between the blue trees in AI. Right? These edges, so far, they have zero importance with respect to separating AI and with respect to separating the previous sets. Why? Because these edges, they never appear in these uh, root trees so far. Some of them might appear in the next step when you look at AI, AI plus 2. But so far, these edges, they never appeared in the, the previous blue trees. So whatever weights we put there, that, was no, that had no importance for what we did so far. And so exactly as you said, Miho, like the, the big freedom we have, and that's a key idea in this proof, is that, you know, we can just rechoose the weights at, at front end. And that's the key, that's how they do it. They look at all the, these red edges in the eye and they say, okay, we are free to choose the weights, but how to choose them? Well, let's just take uh, new weights at random. But actually, the way we are going to take the new weights at random is uh, in each component of the weights, well, in theory, you could, you could take a number between minus 1, 0, or 1. But actually, we will never choose zero. So this really, you know, you know, we, we really somehow we want to increase the chance that we are going to map the two endpoints of a red edge to, to these two vertices, right? So, uh, so we are actually putting, we are actually getting uh, taking random vectors where each component is minus one or one. So we make so every red edge here, we take uh, such a random vector. We make these uh, choices. Uniformly at random and independently. Okay? And now, okay, so I, I will need to, to skip this proof, but the, the fact here that is mentioned here is exactly what you, what you said, Miho, is that when you, when you, if you only ch change the weight vectors on the red edges, it has no influence on what we did so far in separating the previous AIs. However, if you think of an AI plus two, a tree in AI plus 2, let me draw in orange a tree in AI plus 2, and a tree in AI plus 2, it will contain a lot of blue subtrees from AI. So it will contain a lot of red edges. And the fact that you contain a lot of red edges and that you care about the vertices in that tree that are not too close to each other means that when you look at two vertices UV that you, for which you really want that they are embedded on distinct points in AI plus 2, so meaning that they are distance at most f of AI plus 2, but at least f of AI plus 1. Well, the path between them, it will contain a lot of red edges. And now the intuition, which should be turned into proof, is that because you have a lot of red edges on such a path, and you take the, these uh, weight vectors at random, you have a very high chance of mapping them to, uh, to distinct points. So I will leave that lemma for the exercise session, but uh, at least you see, uh, I mean, and I should say that 
it doesn't use any tool, this proof. It's just we do these random choices and you just compute and you see it works. Right, so we are not using any toolbox, anything from the toolbox of the probabilistic method. Right, so it's very, very basic, but very, very clever in a sense. Um, so okay, so you see how the embedding is constructed. <laughs> what I didn't uh, do with you is show you that uh, with positive probability, this uh, random choices work. We are going to uh, revisit that in the exercise section. Okay, did it make sense so far? Okay, are you ready to have something lighter for the last five minutes? Oh, there is a question about that. So how do you make sure that you that it doesn't spread too far? That you still are that your embedding is still within the box that you want it to be. Uh, do you mean in terms of number of dimensions? Because we are not Ah so there is no no box. There is there is no box, right? Okay. All right, okay. Another question. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry, I have a few quick questions. So yes. Is there any intuition how do you live this two general graphs? <laughs> like one sentence? Because I just cannot imagine. Uh, one sentence? Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid I cannot do it. Okay. Um, they use padded decompositions. That rings the bell. This is one of the tools I think they introduced in that paper. In the, it became a... a I hope they introduced it, or at least it, they popularized, popularized it if they did not introduce it. Um, that's one way of going from trees to, to graph. Yeah, so, uh, Frank? Um, sorry, can, can you remind us like the definition of k when you said like you go from a0 to ak? Yeah, so k is a log log of the diameter. It's, it's just because we, we at some point, we, we finish uh, building these partitions. Essentially, in the last partition you're going to build, you just have one big tree. That, that is actually your starting tree. Because I was wondering why you had to like do this deterministic part like on like a constant Q, and then use this random process. Yeah. So, so why do we have to do the, the deterministic part? I mean, mean, like, why can we do it like on a K directly? The deterministic part. Yes. Oh, because that, that would be way too many bits because you would use log n bits where n is the number of the vertices in your tree and then the way we bounded it is that you, s you know we said that it's at most 3f k in that case to the gamma but then what do we get? f k, well k is log log of the diameter so f k is about the diameter so okay let's pretend this is about the diameter so you actually get the power of the diameter, but whatever. Uh, so you get about the diameter to the, the exponent gamma. So when you take the log, you get actually uh, some gamma uh, uh, gamma log of the diameter. Right? And by the way, this was actually a previous embedding. It was just to do the probabilistic argument, but well, a modified probabilistic argument on, on the whole tree right away. Essentially, it's choose all the weight vectors at random in one go. But then, I mean, if you do the standard analysis, you would get that the number of dimensions you need is grows like gamma times, I guess, log of the diameter. So you, it's not only, don't, doesn't want, it doesn't depend only on gamma. Yes? Uh, just one quick question. So this gives you a polynomial time algorithm that is randomized. Yes. Compute the embedding, yeah? It can be randomized. <laughs> uh, I, I should look it up. I, I don't want to say something wrong, okay. so let me look it up. Yeah, I mean, I would guess, but I, I, I should check. Yes, I mean, that's, that's nice because it's quite different from what we did in, in, the, in the course so far because it's, you know, it's a very different way of building these. Uh, so, the logarithmic diameter, even better, should be just good for us. You don't need probabilistic at all. Oh, uh, for the, if you allow dependence on the diameter, yes, yes, then that, that's uh, completely determined. All right, <laughs> so let me, if there are no more questions, uh, let me maybe just quickly end with two minutes of a view of what one could look at in this uh, uh, area of product structure. 
So there are a few open questions that were mentioned during the lectures already. Uh, like a recurring one is, you know, try to get the best possible bounds, right? For the two versions. So the, the second version is the one that you typically apply if you want to get the best bounds. But you, you know, we don't know whether you, you should really take a product with a, a triangle there. Maybe this could be avoided, or maybe just a K2. This is open. And for the first version, well, it would be interesting to know what's the best constant there that you can put. We know it's at least three. And if you could put a tree there, well, it's the same as saying that you can get rid of the triangle there. Okay, so far we know that we can put uh, a six there. Uh, obviously, there are the corresponding questions for the other classes that have product structure. Let me maybe repeat the, the question for K planograph. In that case, we have H times P times a click, and the tree width of H is about KQ, and the click is of size about K squared. And the question people have been looking at is can you, well, can you have the tree width of H to be a constant, even like it's allowing for blow up in the click size? This is still open, but some people think it's doable. At least I hope so. Um, and very recently, these authors proved that it's true for a subclass of K-planar graphs, uh, which is called H-framed graphs, whatever that is. That's a sub subclass of K-planar graphs, and in that case, they proved it's true. That's, uh, so that's how they are approaching this, approaching this problem by showing that it's at least true in, in a special case. This way, they have one planar and two planar, because uh, those that stage, every two planar is embedded in something like five planar, six planar. Mm -hmm. so okay, so another research direction is related to what I uh, mentioned today. So we focus on what can be embed into iterated strong products of paths. And now we have a good understanding, well, we have some understanding of that. This is classes with polynomial codes. But now, if we go back to the initial team, is what if we start with a bounded tree graph times that? Can we capture anything interesting there? And that's, that's a research direction we see definitely open. Um, so, okay, we, we've seen that we can have a polynomial growth for the, for the, the, the path here. And then there is a conjecture, for instance, that if you look at the so called nearest neighbor graphs in RD. So say K nearest neighbor. So you have points in RD, and then every point you make, you connect it to the K nearest neighbors. That's a graph you define in RD. And it was conjectured, you know, that such graphs, they have a product structure that looks like this. And you would need some number of dimensions because you are in RD. This is open. But if it's true, this would be a somehow a natural class that is captured by such a product structure. So it's open for the at least three. It's true when the is two. Uh, what else? Well, obviously the main uh, of, uh, direction, research direction, is uh, finding applications, right? Finding, uh, solving some new, uh, uh, finding some new solutions for open programs on planograms. Uh, we've seen some uh, some cases where it works in this course. Uh, Maybe I should mention that there were some successes, but a lot of figures that I didn't mention, like I and I think others also tried many problems on, that are open on planar graphs and for which couldn't find a way to apply the product structure, right? So it's not a universal recipe. Your problem needs to be well behaved somehow with respect to taking the strong point of the path. But you know, it's quite likely that there are still some uh, nice problems that can be uh, uh, approach using the structure, so that's definitely the main direction. Now let me finish with a, a, a last direction which I think hasn't been looked at. I don't know if there is anything to do there, but let me mention it. Uh, is, can, is there any interesting algorithmic applications? Like there are lots of algorithmic applications of Baker's layering technique. Right? This is like one of the basic tools there. And the question is here, I mean, do you gain anything for algorithmic applications by using the product structure, or, it, or does it not tell you anything more than, than uh, Baker's layering? So for instance, Baker's layering has been used to get approximation algorithms for NPR programs on 
spin a graph, can you improve some of these approximation ratio? I don't know any uh, such example. Yeah, so I should mention, of course, that the product structure can be computed in polynomial time and can even be computed in linear time. So we, you really need that, obviously. Uh, but let's, you know, throw, let's throw in some concrete questions. Random questions, I haven't talked about them, but, you know, just to suggest some different questions to think about. So let's look at max cut. Max cut is, is NP hard, right? You want to uh, find a cut in your graph with a maximum number of edges in the unweighted case, in the weighted case, uh, maximum weight. Um, and, well, this is NP hard, but a beautiful fact, it's, a, it's in P for, for pen graphs. And compute a max cut in polynomial time in kind of graphs. And it has been generalized to, to graphs on surfaces. But as far as I know, it's, it's open for apex minor free graphs. Whether well, the complexity status, I think we don't know if it's P or P hard. So, you know, I, I don't know if max cut can be solved in polynomial time on, on graphs that are subgraphs of H times P, where H has one metric. If you, if you could find a way to do that, then you know, it would generalize to apex minor free graphs or whatever class that has a product structure. Uh, I'm just mentioning one problem, but you can look at, all, at others. Like, uh, if you want to look inside P, you know, shortest paths can be computed quickly on tenor graphs in big of n times. Can you do that for subgraphs of H times P? Can you compute maximum flows very quickly on subgraphs of H times P? Et etc. et cetera. Okay, so these are other research directions. Okay, let me stop there because I'm already over time. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> <laughs>